All right. Um, I want to get back into the topic of stereochemistry uh, because it is a, a topic which is um, also somewhat can be somewhat confusing for people, and I think we need to go over um, in some review as well. So recall from a week ago, we were talking about the fact that tetrahedral carbons, if they have all four different groups attached, then they can be arranged in two different ways in three-dimensional space. Uh, and these compounds are no longer identical. Uh, they are not superimposable. Uh, so if you look at those two isomers of, of a methane molecule, for example, uh, they are not superimposable. You can't overlap one on top of the other and make it look exactly the same. And this is a type of stereoisomer which we refer to as uh, mirror image isomers or enantiomers. So recall the terminology that we've been talking about. Enantiomers. Enantiomers are stereoisomers which are mirror images of each other. So they're exact mirror images, but they're not identical. They're different. They're not superimposable. And this type of relationship, when we have mirror images that are not the same, we refer to as chiral molecules or chirality. Um, and that has to do with a molecule having no symmetry. So if you can't bisect the molecule like with an imaginary mirror plane anywhere, uh, then it's the mirror image of the whole molecule has to be different. Okay, it's one thing to look for when you're trying to identify molecules which are chiral. Uh, molecules that are chiral often have uh, a, a specific carbon within them. That is the one that has four different groups attached. That's what we refer to as the stereogenic carbon. But that's not the, a molecule can certainly have more than one stereogenic carbon. Okay? Stereogenic carbons, you know, we can have molecules with lots of stereogenic carbons in them, which means there's actually a lot of possibilities for different stereoisomers, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today. So remember, when we're talking about molecules that are enantiomers, um, the only physical property that they actually display that are different, aside from how they might interact with something else that's also chiral, uh, is that they rotate plane polarized light in opposite directions. It's the only physical property that we can observe without some other chiral group interacting with it. Uh, and because that depends on the property of the molecule, if you have a 50-50 mixture and you measure its optical activity, 50-50 mixture we call a racemic mixture, uh, Essentially, the rotation in one direction is canceled out by an equal number of molecules rotating the light in the other direction. So what we see in the result in the end is that we don't see any rotation. So it looks like it's not chiral if you have a 50-50 mixture exactly. If you have a mixture of enantiomers, which is something else besides a 50-50 mixture, you will see some rotation. It just won't be the maximum that that molecule should be if it's absolutely pure. And, and before we had better analytical techniques, this optical activity allowed people, and, and the amount of rotation actually allowed people to get an estimate of the ratio of two enantiomers in a solution. Um, so they could be correlated along that way. It's not as accurate as modern uh, high-performance liquid chromatography, uh, which we can use today to get much more accurate uh, make ratios of enantiomers. Um, but uh, it was an, a very important technique used for characterizing and analyzing mixtures of stereoisomers. Okay, so recall that uh, we, we started talking about how we actually determine the configuration and we assign it a specific naming system. Uh, that tells us when we see the name of a molecule exactly what the three-dimensional configuration is. Um, and this was using our priority rules that we learned for EZ stereochemistry to identify the priorities of the four different groups attached on a specific stereogenic carbon. And then we can sign that configuration as either an S configuration or an R configuration, depending on the orientation of those groups. So again, in order, in order to determine that, the lowest priority group is pointed towards the back, 
in the structure you're looking at, the three-dimensional structure. Then from one to two to three, if you go counterclockwise, it's the S, or to the left direction, it's the S. And if it's clockwise, it would be the R isomer. So that's the indication, and we talked about uh, how if it's drawn in different ways on the paper, uh, one way that can help you see which one it is is to use your hand and thumb. It really works, so try it. It does work and helps to figure out the configuration based on which direction then your thumb points with the lowest priority group and then going from one to two to three, which hand you need to go in the right direction. Okay. So I want to take a look at uh, some more examples. We had an example last time where we uh, saw several different stereogenic centers. Here's the molecule glucose, written not in the chair form, but just in the, in the flat ring form. But I've shown the bold and dashed lines to indicate the centers where there is stereochemistry. So you should be able to recognize that in this molecule, there are five stereogenic carbons, five different ones. I'll just highlight them here. Uh, and there are the configurations. So the question is, would you be able to figure out those configurations on your own looking at that? No. Well, let's go through these. I think it's useful to take some time and go through these. So how do you do that? Well, again, when you're doing this in a molecule which has a lot of stereocenters, focus on one at a time, and then we've got to figure out the priorities. So let's just look at this one uh, on the top that has this group right here, this one. Okay, so we focus on that carbon, that particular stereogenic carbon. The substituent that's attached is coming out of the plane of the board, right? And the other two bonds that are the ring are in the plane of the board. That means the hydrogen that's not written there must be going back away from us. So it's useful to draw that in if it's not written there to help you recognize what the groups are and where they're at. Okay? So hopefully it's easy to see which one's the lowest priority. Hydrogen. And if you have a hydrogen on the carbon, that's always going to be the lowest priority. And other groups are going to be next. So that's the fourth priority. Now we have three other groups we need to assign the priority. We have an oxygen, we have a, a carbon, and we have a carbon. So of those three groups on that particular stereogenic center, what are the priorities? Which is highest? Oxygen, carbon, carbon. Which would have highest priority? Thank you. <laughs> I knew it wasn't that hard. So that has to be number one. The oxygen has to be number one. OK, now we have two other carbons. How do we distinguish the priorities between those two? The next group out. So this carbon is attached to a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and an oxygen. And this carbon is attached to a hydrogen, a carbon, and an oxygen. Right? So obviously the group going towards the left is the next priority, would be number two. And the group on top is number three. Does anyone have trouble doing that? If you are having difficulty seeing that, uh, you really should um, practice those priority rules and look at the variety of different molecules and see how to identify those priority rules. So let me clean this up again. Put on our priorities that we just determined. One, two, three. So if we draw a circle in the direction of one to two to three, the hydrogen lowest priority group is pointing to the back. It's pretty easy. We're going in a clockwise direction. So the configuration is R for that particular stereocenter, R on top. I did it right on the, on the, all the yellow ones. So that was R. Um, again, if, you, if you're using the hand technique, if you point your left hand towards the back of the board, you're going in a curving in a counterclockwise direction. If you put your right hand against the board, you're curving in a clockwise direction. Okay, so you need your right hand, R, 
to get that configuration. Okay, now glucose is a good molecule to do this with because um, you really have to look carefully at the priorities in some of these examples. So we know that the first one is R. Uh, I'm just going to keep a note of, well, R. Let's take a look at the next one to the left. This stereocenter, where is the hydrogen group that's not written there? It, it must be coming out towards us, coming out from the board. So I'll put a bold line there. That's also number four priority. Okay, so hydrogen is four. The other three groups are oxygen, carbon, and carbon. Okay, so it's easy to see hopefully the number one priority would be the oxygen, right? We just did it before. That's number one. Now we've got to distinguish between this carbon and this carbon, which has higher priority. Notice it's a little bit more difficult because they're both more highly substituted. So carbon and carbon, we can't tell. The carbon here on the bottom is attached to one oxygen, one hydrogen, and one carbon. Oops. The um, the carbon at the top is attached to two oxygens. I'm sorry, it's not. One oxygen, one carbon, and one hydrogen, right? So we can't even distinguish when we go out there. So then we gotta go further. This oxygen is attached to a carbon. This oxygen is attached to a hydrogen. There's a distinction. The carbon is attached to an oxygen and a carbon. This carbon is attached to an oxygen and hydrogen. If you add them all up, I think what you'll see is that the highest priority is going to be towards the oxygen in the ring. And I hope I did that right. So if, if that's the priorities, then the configuration going from 1 to 2 to 3 in this direction would be RS. Yes, that's right, because the hydrogen is coming out this time. So it's the opposite of what we actually see. If you're looking from the back side with the hydrogen pointing away from you, you go counterclockwise, or you need your left hand pointed with the thumb out to go that direction. Okay, now this is um, the same if we go down then to the next carbon here. Hydrogen is going back. So that's number four. Oxygen is number one. And we gotta figure out which of the other two groups are two, priority two and priority three. So here's a carbon, here's a carbon. One oxygen, one hydrogen, one carbon, one oxygen, one hydrogen, one carbon. We go out further this carbon and this carbon. This carbon is attached to two oxygens. So actually it's going to be that direction towards the bottom, which is going to be the next highest priority. Isn't the other carbon attached to that? Oh. No, it's attached to a carbon and an oxygen. Yeah, that's a carbon, so be careful about that. It's easy to get lost in that. That's why I'm kind of doing this a little fast, but you remember before when we were looking at these priority rules and I would just draw a line in the atom and then draw like a tree and keep drawing it out, that can really help you keep track of each layer as you go further and further out. It's more complicated when you have to go further away from your starting point. But in this case, that's number two and that's number three. The hydrogen is pointing towards the back. It's going counterclockwise, so that's also S. So far we had what, RSS? We'll see how good I am at the end. Okay, this one. Hydrogen coming up. Priority one, oxygen. Hydrogen four. This carbon or this carbon? The one on the right or the one on the left is next. 
The carbon on the right is attached to two oxygens, the carbon on the left is attached to one. So this should be two, and this should be three. And you need your right hand for that. Hydrogen pointing up. So that should be R. And the last one in this case, here. Now, which is the highest priority? In all the other cases, the OH seems to be the highest priority group. What's the highest priority group here? Yeah, the oxygen that's attached to a carbon. So we have O attached to carbon versus O attached to hydrogen. So that's going to be priority one. This one will be priority two. The carbon will be priority three. So that is also the S configuration. So you see how I went through this? And again, if you're having trouble determining the priorities, be really systematic and careful and draw it out until you can see it a little more clearly. It, it'll really help. So yeah, R, S, S, R, S. I did them right. R, S, S, R, S. So by the way, in terms of sugar molecules, there are different sugars that have the same uh, structure, the same number of atoms, and the six-membered rings. If you just switch the stereochemistry, for example, that's a different sugar. If you switch the stereochemistry at this position or that position, they're different sugars. So some of the different sugars are simply stere different stereoisomers of glucose. Uh, there are more sugars than that, but in, in this case, one thing to recognize, if you were to take the mirror image of glucose, think about taking the mirror image of glucose. If you take the mirror image, what happens to the configuration of the stereocenter? Yes, it'll be the opposite. So in S configuration, we become R. If you take a mirror image of the whole molecule, which has more than one, every center should be opposite. So I'm not going to draw the molecule, but I'll draw the uh, letters here. So you'll have S, R, R, S, R for those stereo centers in the mirror image. That would be the enantiomer. Okay. We're going to talk about molecules that have more than one stereo center in it. What happens if you just switched one of them and not the others? What kind of isomer is that? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, let's uh, look at a couple of those. Before I talk about some of the other aspects of this, let's take a look at some other examples. So let's say, for example, Take a look at this molecule. How many stereo centers are in this molecule? How many stereogenic carbons? There are two. I've shown two with bold and dash, and if you look carefully at this specific one, each of the four groups attached to that carbon is different. And if I look at that specific one, each of the four groups attached to carbon is different. Okay. Um, compare that to this molecule. Oops, I just want to do something else. Oh no, that's fine. Similar molecule, that's a bold line. Is it the same isomer or a different isomer? Well, one, one way to tell, because remember, molecules can be drawn in all different ways. One way to tell and compare the relationship between molecules, is it a mirror image, is it a, a different kind of isomer, is to look at the configurations and then compare those positions along the molecule. So if we look at 
this molecule on the left. Let's take a look at this first stereo center right here. Okay, hydrogen is shown going to the back. Let's figure out the configuration. The priorities for these groups. Chlorine, hydrogen, carbon, carbon. Obviously, we have our highest and our lowest, right? So that's one, that's four. And now we have two carbons, a CH3 versus a carbon attached to more things. So this is going to be two, and that's going to be three. So the configuration for that stereo center is R. Okay. The other isomer, hydrogen now is coming up. It's going to be like this, one, two, three, and four. This stereo center goes clockwise, but the hydrogen is coming out towards you, not going back away from you. So that's also going to be the R configuration. So this first molecule has two stereo centers. 2R, 4R, 2,4-dichloro, pentane. Okay. How about the other molecule that I've drawn here? Well, this looks exactly the same as the other one. One, two, three. Hydrogen going to the back. This must be the R configuration. Okay. And this one has... And the other stereo center here, hydrogen is going to the back. One, two, three. It has the S configuration. Okay, because I have to go clockwise or use my left hand. So that's a different isomer. It's not a mirror image. And I want you to uh, realize that. It's not a mirror image. It's a different isomer. But it's still a stereo isomer because we haven't changed the wave atoms are bonded together. They're just arranged differently in three-dimensional space. Um, I could easily do something like, let's see how much room I have on this slide. Give you a second to write that down. I can draw molecules in all kinds of ways, and sometimes they look different, but they're actually the same, because if you, if I, I rotated a, a one bond, but I really didn't change the position much. If I had rotated a uh, ro relative stereo centers in a different way, one that I showed in a bold in one case would show a back, a dash in another case, and it might look different, but it could actually be the same as just a different rotation. So for example, if I do something like this, Drawing's terrible, sorry. So what's the relationship between those two molecules? Those are exactly the same. It might look different, but look at the way I've drawn the carbon backbone. The carbon backbone in one case, the molecule on the right, is in the zigzag fashion, and the molecule on the left doesn't have the zigzag carbon backbone. All I've done to go from the molecule on the left to the molecule on the right is rotate that center bond. Okay? I haven't really changed the stereochemistry or changed the configuration. The way to confirm that again is to look carefully at the configurations and really compare them, because that'll tell. So uh, just to let you know, this first Alcohol has the R configuration, and the bromine has the S configuration. And if you don't believe me, you should go through it and really double check it. Uh, in the other molecule, this one has the R configuration, and this one has also the S configuration. Why? Because the hydrogen is pointing up. All I did, again, was rotate that center carbon-carbon bond the way I've just drawn it on the page. So. One, two, three, that would be the S configuration if the hydrogen is pointing up, right? So be really careful when you're looking at these molecules 
then you're really identifying what the configurations are because that's the direct comparison when you're looking at two molecules together. Okay? I know the homework assignment has a, a number of examples where you are looking at and con determining configurations. Um, please, please do those because I think it will really help. Okay, just for your information, uh, this is, I don't think this was really in your chapter, but I just wanted to point out that there are other kinds of chirality uh, that we find in molecules that actually don't have a stereogenic center. It's kind of interesting because when you have molecules which you would think wouldn't be chiral that display chiral properties, it's because we have some kind of restricted rotation and their mirror image happens to be different. So for example, uh, this happens a lot when we see benzene rings which are connected by a single bond. So actually, if they're just hydrogens on the benzene ring, these can freely rotate. But if you have different groups on them, notice I have four different groups like that, but that they're too big and interlocked, you can't freely rotate. So if you look at this molecule that I just marked up here, if you look at this molecule where we have an ethyl group coming out towards us, relative to the molecule where that ethyl group is going away from us in this rotation, and they can't interconvert, those are actually mirror images. So, so we sometimes see this, what we refer to as axial chirality in molecules that can't rotate all the way around. Often when we have uh, bulky rings that are sterically crowded and can't rotate, through a single bond. So I just want to point that out because uh, these are kinds of molecules we do encounter that can show stereochemistry. It's kind of interesting. Well, we've talked about reactions and, and uh, we had some exam questions about this particular reaction. Electrophilic addition to a double bond and actually what we haven't really focused on is the fact that when we do the addition of HPR to a molecule like pentene, one pentene, we actually generate a new stereogenic center when we do that reaction. This is one of the most difficult things in chemistry to control, and this is what organic chemists spend a lot of effort and time trying to control. How do you get a reaction to form one enantiomer, one mirror image over the other? Okay. Think about reactivity, and we've talked a lot about reactions and reaction mechanisms. What dictates the path of a reaction? What's important for determining what product outcome you get? Well, if you have the possibility for two different products, there has to be a difference in energy in the path to get there, right? So it'll take the lower energy pathway, and the higher energy pathway will uh, be less favored, and you'll get less of it. So you get a major product will favor a lower energy pathway. Well, let's think about this reaction in detail. Electrophilic addition to HBr, you take the electrons from the double bond and protonate. So that proton actually ended up on the end here. And what's left behind is a carbocation. Right? What's the structure of a carbocation? It's sp2 hybridized. It's planar. And I've tried to represent that here, showing the p orbital. Okay. And if you look at that p orbital, if the bromide adds on the top side, you'll form the R product. And if the bromide adds on the bottom side, you'll form the S product. Okay, so take a look at that. Would there be any difference in the energy for those two possibilities? Is one side of that system, the top P of the P orbital, different in, in steric uh, strain than the bottom side? No, they're absolute, they're identical. There's no difference in energy. This is the problem. When we do reactions that generate new stereogenic centers, we need to have a way to distinguish or make a chiral difference between one side and the other. 
because right now they're equivalent and there would be no selectivity. You'll get an equal amount of both stereoisomers that result. An equal mixture of enantiomers or a racemic mixture. Okay, there's no way to control that just as it is. The only way chemists have the ability to control that is to have something else chiral that makes one side different than the other. Makes one side higher energy than the other to, to add that next group. The step that actually forms the stereocenter. So it's something we need to be uh, also aware of. We do generate mixtures of stereoisomers when we do reactions which generate stereogenic carbons. Now let's talk about the other types of stereoisomers. Um, this is the term we use for molecules which are stereoisomers which are not mirror images. So we have the term enantiomer. Enantiomer are mirror image stereoisomers. Everything else that is a stereoisomer in the relationship between two molecules, we refer to as a diastereomer. And just the easy definition, diastereomers are stereoisomers which are not mirror images. Okay, so let's look at this. Stereoisomers, we have this broad category of stereoisomers. Right? Molecules which have the same atoms bonded to the same atoms, but they're arranged differently in three-dimensional space somehow. And we've seen several different ways that can be done. Enantiomers, mirror image isomers, okay? Everything else, the relationship is a diastereomer. So there's basically two categories of stereoisomers. Okay, but what all, what all have we seen in class so far? What kind of other stereoisomer have we talked about previous to this chapter? Green compounds, double bonds. Those are types of stereoisomers, the cis-trans stereoisomers. These are actually a form of stereoisomer because they're fixed in space, rigid. Uh, you can't interconvert one to the other. Okay, the trans double bond and the cis double bond only differ by their arrangements in each three dimensions, right? But they're not chiral. They're not mirror. They don't. They're mirror images. If you take the trans two butene and look at the mirror image of trans two butene, it's still trans two butene. Okay. If you look at these molecules, interestingly, the cis trans, cis and trans cyclohexane derivatives that I've shown here, in this particular case, their mirror images are a little more complicated. The top one, its mirror image is identical. The bottom one, it's different. But these, the relationship between these two, they're not mirror images of each other. Okay. So they're a diastereomer. They're a cis and a trans diastereomer. Okay, so we have that cis trans stereoisomerism. Um, and now, when, what, what happens when we have, as I was just talking about before, molecules with more than one, in, one stereogenic carbon in it? You can have stereoisomers, which are not mirror images, which we refer to as configurational diastereomers. They're just different by the configuration of one of two or more stereogenic carbons. So if you take a look at, this is actually happens to be the molecule tartaric acid that I've drawn in one particular way. If you look at tartaric acid on the left and the tartaric acid on the right, they are mirror images of each other and those are enantiomers. And if you look at the actual configuration of both of those stereocenters. On the left you have the SS stereoisomer and on the right you have R and R for those configurations. Okay, They're enantiomers, they're mirror images. If you look at the compound where instead of changing both configurations we have S on the top, but R on the bottom shown here. That 
is a different stereoisomer than the one on the right or the one on the left. But it's not a mirror image of either one. Okay, so tartaric acid actually has two uh, sets of uh, stereoisomers. One is a mirror image, one are the relationship between them are diastereomeric relationships. Okay, and again, the one way to easily see that is just to compare the configurations. In this case, what happens is one of the configurations is the same and one is different. So it's not a complete mirrorage. That's the way to tell the diastereomer, one easy way. Uh, that would be true for the molecule on the left, or if you compare also the same in the molecule on the right, R is S here, R is R is the same there. Okay? So I want you to become more aware and being able to recognize these, these differences in the configurations. Now, tartaric acid is interesting because, let me just back up a, a second here. Um, if you look at these mirror images that we just talked about, the SS configuration, oh, something's missing. The SS configuration has a mirror image of the RR configuration, right? So those are obviously enantiomers. But if you look at the SR isomer, the one on the bottom, what does its mirror image look like? And if you look at the mirror image for that molecule, what's the difference? They're actually identical because the molecule is symmetric from the top to the bottom. Now this is true because the rest of the groups on the molecule are the same. So for example, if we go beyond those stereocenters, this group is the same as this group. And what that does is it creates a situation where the molecule now, if you draw it this way, notice there's a, a, pla a mirror plane of symmetry which bisects that molecule. Its mirror image, actually if you take this molecule and just leave it right on the plane of the board and rotate it 180 degrees and slide it over, it would line up exactly, right? Hopefully you can do that in your mind. It lines up exactly, it's identical. So the mirror image of this particular isomer of tartaric acid isn't an enantiomer, it's the same. This is an interesting situation where it's a molecule that contains stereogenic carbons in it, but its mirror image is the same. This is what we refer to as a meso compound. It has higher symmetry in the molecule, a plane of symmetry, that means that its mirror image is the same. Okay, so this is a now, any molecule that has no stereogenic centers, they typically don't have a mirror plane, or they typically will have a mirror plane too, and they're not chiral. These are also not chiral. They don't show any chirality properties like rotating plane of light because their mirror images are the same. And one way also, this is, this is a, a type of molecule which also can be confusing for students, so I want to point out that because of the symmetry of the molecule, because those groups are the same on one end versus the other, and it's completely symmetric, one way to tell is you could number it from either direction, it'd be the same molecule, right? You can number one, two, three, four. So this would be 2s, 3r. And you could number this one, one, two, three, four. It would be 2s, 3r, right? because you can number it from the other direction. If you can do that, it's likely it's going to be a meso compound. It's going to have a plane of symmetry somehow, somewhere, and will be identical. Okay, now a little bit about physical properties. I mentioned that the physical properties that we typically measure for various molecules, melting points, boiling points, densities, uh, refractive index, other things like that, 
they are identical for enantiomers, but that's not true for diastereomers. Diastereomers, when you have two molecules which are not mirror images but are stereoisomers, they can have different physical properties. So if you look at these three different isomers for tartaric acid, we have a pair of enantiomers, and you can tell which ones they are just looking at the physical properties. Uh, the SS tartaric acid and the RR tartaric acid are the enantiomers. Notice they have exactly the same melting point, 168 to 170 degrees, exactly the same density. The only difference is they rotate plane polarized light in opposite directions, but the same amount, just in opposite directions. Okay. But if you compare let's say the RR isomer to the SR, the meso compound here, a different diastereomer. It has a different melting point, it has a different density, and it's not chiral, so you don't have any optical rotation at all. So you have different physical properties. So in principle, you could actually use physical methods to physically separate them. And that's, that's something that's very useful. We can separate diastereomers using um, solid phase chromatography. Using uh, We could melt them at different points. They could crystallize differently. Uh, there are a lot of different things we can do. They might have different solubilities and different solvents. So in this way, we could actually use physical methods to find a way to separate them. So diastereomers have different physical properties. So I want to kind of give you the overall picture of this whole spectrum of isomers. So globally, right, we've used this term isomer. That's a very broad definition that just means you have a molecule with the same number and kinds of atoms, but they're different somehow. They're somehow different molecules. And within that, we have two categories, constitutional isomers. That means this carbon must, might be bonded in a different place. So the, the actual the skeletal framework of bonds between atoms is different. Okay. That encompasses all of those isomers. If it's only different in the three-dimensional arrangement, it's a stereoisomer. And we just talked about that. We have enantiomers, mirror images, and diastereomers, those that are not mirror images. And to break that down even further, Two kinds of diastereomers. The cis-trans diastereomers, which don't necessarily have to be chiral, and configurational, which is having two or more stereogenic centers where the difference is not that they're not all mirror images of each other. Okay? There are a lot of isomers to talk about. Um, we've covered all of these definitions throughout the semester so far, and it, it is important to be able to recognize those differences within molecules because each different molecule behaves differently in different situations. Okay, so I want to come back to this, this uh, topic of reactions that produce stereocenters and give you an idea about what we do as chemists to think about trying to control that. Um, so for example, I told you if you add HBr to a double bond, you have a, an intermediate, which is symmetric. The top and the bottom are identical in terms of uh, the energy of that next group adding. So you get a 50-50 mixture of the two enantiomeric products. Okay? That's true also for other reactions. If you look at the bromination reaction, remember we talked about this reaction a couple chapters ago, where if we add Br2 to the double bond, we form a bromonium ion. Notice that that is also symmetric. If you look at the addition here, if you add the bromine there, uh, I should have done this the other way. That one will give this product. And if you add the bromine here, it will give this product. Right? Because that adds, and then like if this adds, then the bond will break. So, what is the relationship between those two? They're both trans 1,2 dibromocyclopentane, right? 
They are enantiomers. They're mirror images of each other. And the, the energy between them, uh, in, the, in the pathway between them, there's no difference between that side and that side attack. Okay, yeah, these are mirror images. So this would be the S. Let's see if I get this right. This will be the SS, and this is the RR. Mirror images, they're the answers. And we get a 50 50 mixture. No way to control it. How we can control that, well, let's just take a look at this too. This is another interesting reaction. If you take cis 2 butene and do the same reaction, what you'll end up with is again, um, even though you have free rotation after the reaction, um, you're still adding the bromines trans across the double bond. And that could happen again in two different sides equally, just like with the cyclopentene. In this case, you form the SS23-dibromobutane and the RR23-dibromobutane. They're enantiomers. I could draw it like that, or if I rotate that single bond between the middle two carbons and draw it in the fully staggered carbon chain, this is still SS, but notice by rotating that up, I've just drawn it differently on the screen, so please recognize that. It could be drawn different ways. So that also forms two different enantiomers, SS and RR. <laughs> What happens if I start with the trans 2 butene? See how complicated this hero chemistry can be? If I start with this trans 2 butene, I also get, notice that in the trans 2 butene, the, the carbon chain is already in the staggered zigzag in the trans 2 butene. And if I add one bromine on top, one bromine on the bottom, in either way, I'll, I could get a couple of different, I could draw a couple of different, but it's symmetric. It might not be easily recognized, but if you draw the molecule in this configuration, in that conformation, you see that there's a plane of symmetry, right? You can see that they're identical. Again, look at the configurations. This is, this is SR and this is RS. You could number that or name it numbering from either direction because it's symmetric one direction to the other. They are identical. But the transbutene gives a different stereochemical outcome. It gives a diastereomer of the cis-2-butene addition. This is, a, this is a diastereomer of the one I showed on the previous slide. Which you get to an antibiotic. Now, if it's not symmetric, let's say I had another methyl group here. Now these are no longer the same because we only number it from one direction. So this is this is how things can get kind of complicated with stereochemistry. Well, how do we actually control then the configuration? The only way that we can make a reaction stereoselective to give us one configuration, one stereogenic configuration over the other, selectively, is to have something else chiral in the molecule. Some chiral environment that now changes the energy of incoming group. So let's take a look at this. If you take a look at this molecule here, 3-methyl cyclopentene. We have a stereogenic center already in the molecule. It's a chiral molecule. If we had a single enantiomer of this, the configuration here at that center, uh, doesn't ch nothing changes at that carbon in, during the reaction. But because the methyl group is pointed in one direction over the other in three-dimensional space, it makes one side of the ring different than the other. Okay, now we've distinguished, made this difference now in a chiral environment. So if you think about the double bond reacting with the bromine to form the intermediate, bromine adding, the bromine could add on the top side of the ring or the bottom side of the ring, right? But those are no longer the same. 
the bottom side of the ring, and drawing from this sideways perspective you can see, this CH3 group takes up steric space. If you put the bromine on the bottom, now those are bumping into each other. So you can imagine as the bromine is actually approaching the double bond, it's going to be more crowded on the bottom. And if it's more crowded and more sterically crowded environment, it's going to be higher energy, right? So what's going to be the most favored pathway? Well, there's going to be a difference in the ratio of these, problems, of these intermediates in that step, right? You're going to get more of this product, or that intermediate, than this intermediate. So right away, even in the first step, the existence of that stereochemistry here changes the ratio. We no longer have a 50-50 mixture of bromine on top, bromine on bottom. We have this one as the major intermediate. Now, from that, we can draw the products adding the bromine. So the bromine could add from this side, or the bromine could add from that to that part. If it adds to the one I've just drawn on the left, you would get this product. But why would that not be favored? They're too close to each other. Yeah, it's coming close to that methyl group that's on the same place. That's going to be a higher energy, less favored pathway. The one that I've shown here, the attack here, where the bromine adds to that carbon, to put the bromine there, pushing this one up over on the left, that will be favored. So you should expect that you will, of the configurations that you've generated by putting these two bromines on, you would expect to be able to uh, select for getting these particular stereo configurations over this one. This will be minor if it's formed. Now that difference in energy will dictate how much of you, you get, but uh, if, if it's more steric, you get better selectivity. If you have a greater energy difference, better selectivity. But that's how we think about controlling these reactions. We have to have something chiral to start with. That's an example of chirality already built into the molecule. So chiral molecules can react to give selective new stereogenic centers. We also use chiral catalysts to be able to generate chiral centers in molecules that don't have any chirality. Because it does make the two different uh, transition state pathways different. Okay, so just in general, what I want you to take away from this is reactions form stereocenters. Some reactions even destroy stereocenters, something to keep in mind. And that it's really difficult to control that exact configuration unless we can have some chiral environment. That's why I think um, if we think about chemistry that goes on within proteins and biological systems, proteins are chiral. They're chiral environments. They actually do stereoselective reactions to generate single enantiomers. So once you have chirality existing in biochemical pathways, then you can generate things selectively and not as racemates. Well, that brings up another issue. If you do have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, how do you separate them? Pasteur got lucky. He found a macroscopic property, basically the shape of a crystal, fortunately in, in resolving tartrates, that he could clearly see with his eye in a magnifying glass that they were mirror image crystals, and he could use tweezers and separate them out. But uh, in most cases, enantiomers have the same physical properties, and we can't separate them. So how do we do that? How do we resolve a mixture of enantiomers into their pure individual mirror image isomers and separate them. That's, a, that's also a very key question that we think about in chemistry. I'm going to skip this. Um, this is a, a field we refer to as chemical resolution, resolution of enantiomers, or how do we get one enantiomer from a mixture. And again, the only way to, the only way to differentiate Stereoisomers is to have something else chiral. If you can create a diastereomeric relationship, then you have ability to crystallize one over the other, the solubility of one will be different over the other, and things like that. Then we have physical ways that we can actually use physical and chemical techniques to separate. 
One way to do that and think about it is to create diastereomeric salts. And this is used commonly in the resolution of drug molecules to separate the enantiomers. Here, for example, if you have a 50-50 mixture of, say, this particular chiral, chiral carboxylic acid, and you happen to have already something chiral that's pure, like this amine, which is a base, you can generate a chiral salt. And now, if you look at the salt, oh darn it, I missed my pen. If you look at the salt, they are diastereomeric in relationship. If you look at both stereocenters between this salt and this salt, we have the R alcohol, the S amine, we have the S alcohol, the S amine. It's not a complete marriage. So in fact, they might have different melting points, different crystallization properties, and we could physically separate it by using crystallization. Okay, so that's actually an ionic bond. We can do this with ionic bonds. It's quite useful. It's done a lot when you have especially acidic and basic functionality. Uh, or you could make covalent bonds. And again, you, you take a mixture of enantiomers, react it with something else that has a configurational center, a stereogenic center that is a single enantiomer and pure, and this combined with this will give one diastereomer, and this combined with this would give a different product, a different diastereomer. Okay, and again, we could probably separate this using crystallization or chromatography or something, some physical method. So that's also another way which we can resolve enantiomers. So there are there are ways to do it. Of course, what it doesn't do is if you're only looking for one, one of the enantiomers to use, then you essentially throw away 50% of your material. So ideally, if we can actually control the selectivity when we create the stereocenter, that's the most efficient way to do synthesis. And that's the hardest thing to do. But practically, these methods for separating enantiomers are actually used very commonly. Now I just want to point out some other notation. Um, sometimes you'll see molecules written with a squiggly line as opposed to a single line or a so uh, If you just have a single line, that doesn't say anything about stereochemistry. If you have a bold line, it's coming out of the board and a dashed line is going away from the board. If you have a squiggly line, it means you have a 50-50 mixture. Okay, so it's one way we could indicate that they have that center we have a mixture of isomers. Okay, so you might see that occasionally, uh, that squiggly line that means a mixture. Well, if carbon is tetrahedral in three dimensions and can have mirror images which are not the same, what about other atoms, other groups? And in fact, you can. Nitrogen, for example, right? although it only has three bonds, it's still tetrahedral in geometry because of the lone pair. Okay, So if you have three groups on the nitrogen and the lone pair, the, the orientation or position of those groups uh, relative to each other uh, means you could have an enantiomeric relationship. The problem with nitrogen, though, just to let you know what we don't see in general is that nitrogen compounds are chiral because they rapidly invert. The problem is there's not much barrier to this inversion of flipping the lone pair from one side to the other. Actually, if you think about it, it's inverting like an umbrella would. You know, you go into a windstorm and the umbrella flips the other way. That's happening with nitrogen quite fast at room temperature. So in fact, what we always see essentially is a non-chiral molecule because it's no way you can ever get one enantiomer more than the other of those because they're constantly equilibrating. That's not true for some other atoms. If you just go down one on the periodic table, phosphine is slower. At room temperature, you can get chiral phosphines and they're quite stable. And so we can actually see enantiomeric phosphine molecules. 
So this property of chirality, and, and I just want to use these to illustrate them. The property of chirality is not just focused on carbon. It could be any atom in which you have three-dimensional arrangements that are, have mirror image isomers which are different. And there are a number of them. Many of the transition metals, depending on what groups are on it, they can have mirror image isomers. Lots of things can have mirror image. Okay. 